Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Brookings and the Africa Security Initiative. I'm Michael Hanlon with the Foreign Policy Program here. Delighted to have uh, two friends and colleagues from Freedom House, uh, John Temin, who is the head of the Africa Program there, and uh, Tiseki Kasambala, who works largely on Southern Africa issues. And we expect to be joined soon by Mousi Segun uh, from Human Rights Watch, who focuses on half of Africa there with her portfolio. We're looking forward to welcoming her as well. But I want to welcome all of you. Thank you for being here. We have a rich and broad topic today of human rights on the entirety of the African continent. And as you know, this continent includes some 54 countries. We tend to have a focus a little more on the sub-Saharan part of Africa here in the Africa Security Initiative, because we have a separate Middle East program. Uh, so, but still, we're around 50 countries, plus or minus, and a, a lot of expertise a lot of people who have spent time working on these countries, living in them. Um, Tiseke is from Malawi, got her undergraduate education there, went to the Netherlands for her graduate education, has done a lot of writing for a lot of African, European, and American publications, and we're just thrilled to welcome her here, I think for the first time, uh, to Brookings. John has been here before. Yeah, great idea. Good call. Thank you. Uh, J John uh, hails from Swarthmore College and sites across the street, and originally from uh, the great state of Massachusetts worked in the policy planning staff at the State Department in the Obama administration, uh, has a longstanding uh, background of research and writing and activity on Africa, did a Fulbright fellowship in Ghana back in the day, and has also penned a very important foreign affairs article on Africa's pivotal states that he co-authored uh, last year, which led to an earlier event we had done here. And so I'm going to stop in just a second and ask them to frame the broad question of human rights in Africa with a very you know, wide sweeping opening question. And then we'll try to bear down as we also hopefully uh, welcome Mousy upon her arrival. But I also wanted to suggest just by one more way of partial narrowing of the focus, at least to start, you're invited to bring up any country you want because we've advertised this as human rights in Africa. And certainly you can also bring up transnational issues or questions that involve more than one country at a time or uh, you know, OAU issues, sort of whatever you prefer. But I thought we could usefully begin to frame the conversation, at least f for my uh, brain, by thinking about the pivotal states that John wrote about before, some of Africa's largest states, which have been in interesting periods of political transformation, many of them, so Ethiopia, Nigeria, my old Peace Corps country of DRC, uh, Kenya. John wrote about Angola, but certainly, if, and I think South Africa. If you're going to talk about Kenya, you can talk about Tanzania, comparably large country. And if we're going to talk about Angola, we can talk about Mozambique, which is having some interesting times. And let's not leave out Sudan as well. So, and Mousy, thank you for joining us. Welcome to Brookings. Uh, no, no trouble at all. We're just, uh, everybody's listening and putting up with my long introduction. So we're still at that stage. Uh, and uh, so now, without further ado, uh, I will ask you to welcome both Mousy and John, because we haven't yet applauded for them. And then I'm going to frame my big, broad question <laughs> to get going. So thank you for being here. So John, if I could really begin by asking you the, you know, the big 60,000 foot question of how do you think about the state of human rights in Africa today? And also, how do you situate that within the broader question of democratic movement and transitions and trends in Africa, since human rights are often partially conflated with political and democratic rights, but they aren't quite the same thing. So I would like to break down the definition and also see how you would just describe the broad landscape, please. Sure. Well, thanks, Mike, for organizing this. And thanks to everybody for, for coming. Um, and I'll say we're really fortunate to have a couple of colleagues based in Africa in Tseke and Mousse who are going to bring a lot of expertise here. Uh, you know, it's awfully hard to generalize across 48, 49 sub-Saharan African countries. Um, I think what we are seeing broadly is a real time of upheaval. And that has a lot of positive consequences in several countries that we'll talk about. <laughs> But it brings with it a lot of flux, mm. and I think we're seeing some of that. Um, you know, we've we've talked in a session here before, and I'll raise again now that you're seeing a lot of leadership change going on in Africa right now. Um, you know, since 2016, sorry, since 2015, there have been 26 transfers of power. You know, more than half the continent. Uh, that's a remarkable rate, frankly, for any part of the world, uh, and especially for a part of the world that is known unfairly in some ways as sort of the place of leaders who stay in power forever and get into their 90s and so forth. 
um, there's still a long way to go in terms of human rights and civil liberties. Um, you know, part of the reason that we have our colleagues in town this week is that we've spent the last couple days uh, reviewing the scores for Freedom House's annual Freedom in the World report. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what those scores are because they don't come out till early in the new year, so you have to wait for that. Uh, but I will say, uh, you know, there was there was a good deal of negativity, unfortunately, going through country by country. Um, but again, that does have a lot to do with some of the changes that are afoot. Um, some groups agitating for reform, I think particularly youth groups, um, and government crackdowns on some of that activity, and government uh, efforts to surveil, in a lot of cases, people's uh, actions in, in a sort of preventive preventive way. You know, I, I will flag two positive stories I think we should be talking about, and then maybe we can come back to them. Uh, you know, one is the continuing story of Ethiopia. Uh, and things are rocky now, um, but still there is a opportunity for democratic transformation and already expanding human rights uh, in a way there wasn't for decades. Uh, and the most recent really interesting story being Sudan. Uh, and of course, a remarkable change in leadership there with President al-Bashir uh, leaving several months ago and now in prison and potentially awaiting uh, some sort of trial beyond the sort of small trial he's currently undergoing. Uh, and definite improvements in day-to-day -day liberties and human rights there. That is all quickly reversible because of some of the people who still hold a lot of power. Um, but those are two stories amongst some, some concerns in a lot of places uh, that I think we want to be focusing on as well. Fantastic. And just one quick follow-up before we go to Tiseke and then Mousy. Could you um, sort of situate this in broad historical uh, perspective as well? You talk about how we're not going to hear your scores for a couple months. And uh, your scores have uh, sort of plateaued in terms of democracy around the world and democracy in Africa, specifically in the last 20 years. To me, that's the first word that comes to mind when I study the trends. Some people talk about reversals. There have been some reversals in a number of countries. There have been, however, some positive steps. So I wonder, is, is that a fair way to think of it, that you saw sort of a burst of improvement in political and human rights through, let's say, much of the 90s? And then in much of the 21st century so far, you've seen progress here, setback there, and it's sort of netted out to about uh, no net you know, movement in either direction. I think that's right. I think first thing to say is that this is a global trend, not yeah. an African trend. Yes. And we talk in, at Freedom House about 13 years of democratic decline, meaning that for 13 years in our ratings, more countries have gone down than have gone up. And I will note the United States has been going down as well. Um, but yes, I mean, as you're describing, you do see, you know, as part of the third wave of democratization that really hit Africa in the 1990s. Uh, and you had some very positive stories of countries holding their first real elections and some transfers of power. Um, and some of that has plateaued recently. And I think one of the real concerning trends is that some of the countries that we have generally thought of as in the relatively well-off category are slipping. Uh, you know, I'll name a couple in West Africa, one being Senegal, uh, where a couple of uh, serious contenders in a presidential election were disallowed from the election for one reason or another. Uh, another is Benin, uh, which has a president who is showing some very authoritarian tendencies, which is having a real knock-on effect in terms of civil rights. Um, and so, you know, as much as of a story that we have of sort of you know, really troubled countries uh, that struggle with basic rights on a daily basis, we also have a story of countries thought to be doing well that are showing some slippage. Thank you. Tiseki, if I could, please, just the same big broad question to you, but narrow it down however you see fit. I know you're focused on one part of the continent more than another, but whatever broad generalizations you'd like to you know, start the conversation with. And again, thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as John said, I think uh, speaking from a Southern Africa perspective, we have also seen um, alternations in power and changes in leadership um, from Zimbabwe um, to Angola to Mozambique. But the question is whether these, uh, this, this alternation of power and this, these elections um, have actually led to any improvement in the livelihoods of the, re of the citizenry in Southern Africa and whether that has actually translated into the opening up of civic space and civil liberties. And uh, speaking from a Southern Africa perspective, what we've seen is elections as just a checkbox, mm. very cosmetic uh, 
um, the very cosmetic holding of elections, um, and yet the dominance of the liberation movements. Um, whether you are talking about Botswana um, and unruling parties, whether we're talking about Botswana, we're talking about Angola with the MPLA, we're talking about Mozambique with RENAMO, um, and South Africa with the ANC. So the trend has been, let's hold regular elections, but let's ensure that we cling on to power. Um, at the same time, what we can say, though, is there has been some positive movement in terms of civic engagement and, and citizens um, challenging this dominant narrative by the ruling parties and the former liberation movements. Um, we have seen, um, I think, political plurality in places like Botswana. With the fracturing of the Botswana Democratic Party, we have seen these challenges coming out in terms of contestation in Malawi in a very closely run election race. Um, and citizens coming out to challenge um, these, these governments. But at the same time, the clampdown in terms of the right to peaceful protest. Just this morning in Zimbabwe, we saw the MDC attempt to hold um, new protests um, against the current economic situation in that country, and the government responding in its usual heavy-handed heavy manner with tear gas um, and, and beatings. So I would say, again, as, as, as is expected, they are gains and there have been reversals. But the trends we're seeing in Southern Africa remain of, of serious concern in terms of how the government's attempts to hold on um, to power um, have, have translated to an increasing narrowing down of civic space. Thank you, that's a great first answer. And before I go to Mousy, I'd like to just sort of bear down one more level of detail on the more specific, narrowly defined question of human rights. Yes. Because, of course, you got at that as well when you talked about the right to protest and the suppression of that right and the violence used against protesters. But I wondered if you could also just give us a, a quick summary for now, and we'll go further yes. later, about other kinds of human rights, uh, individual rights in criminal cases, for example, or uh, right to fair trial, prison conditions, the sorts of things that I know Human Rights Watch thinks about, and I'm sure, Mousy, you'll get into as well, and we all will in the course of the afternoon. But uh, you began sort of, at, as John did, as I had asked, at a political level. Could you also now get to sort of more that individual human rights level? How do you see the trends in South Africa, Southern Africa over the last few years in, in that domain? Yeah, so um, we, we, we have the institutions that are in place, um, questions, but questions remain over the independence of the judiciary, the ability of um, uh, vulnerable and marginalized communities um, to get equal, equal treatment before the law. Um, we have seen attacks on people living with, uh, people with albinism in places like Malawi. We continue to see attacks against um, the LGBTI community. Um, we see, despite um, progressive laws in certain countries, um, continued attacks on, 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 on women and, 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 and gender-based violence um, at extremely high levels, South Africa being one example. Well, we continue to see the security services and the police forces um, behaving in, in, highly partisan, um, in a highly partisan manner, um, the examples of the clampdown on peaceful protest, but in general, um, detentions, um, um, arbitrary detentions and um, long-term, long detentions in terms of people who have, who have been accused of crimes. So there's a huge um, challenge when it comes to um, institutions, and I think that's reflected in, in other parts of the continent as well. Um, at the same time, as, as I've been saying, we have seen some, some interesting um, developments. For example, uh, Botswana and Angola both repealing um, um, anti-LGBTI laws um, in, in this year, and I think that's been a very positive development for our region. Great, thank you. Mousy, uh, same big broad questions to you, please, with whichever geographic focus you'd like to take. I know you work on a lot of countries, so you know, however you can begin to make sense in the first approximation of overall trends, and then we'll get, bear down on more detail later. So, so in terms of, uh, and I'll just start with an apology for community. I, my last meeting ran over and it was just difficult to pull myself out of it, so I'm sorry I, I got in here late. No problem. Um, so looking at the trends in, in sub-Saharan Africa, it's you know, starting from the Sahel and the Lake Chad Basin area, it's the armed Islamist insurgencies that we see with the attendant response from government forces that's always heavy-handed, uh, profiling and attacking particular ethnic groups, um, whether it's the poor, Fulani, 
in the Mali, Burkina Faso area, or it's the Kanuri um, and Kanuri speaking people in, in the Lake Chad Basin area, in Nigeria, in Chad, in Nigeria, and a little bit of, of Cameroon. Um, and so you, you have all of that, which defines most of the issues that we work on, Human Rights Watch, and I, I guess a lot of other human rights organizations in West Africa. But you also have, um, like uh, both of my colleagues have said, the, the restriction on civic space that's becoming a fashion um, across West Africa. I think the first country that passed um, those kind of NGO restriction laws was Sierra Leone. And, and then every country has gone from Sierra Leone to copy and to paste almost verbatim mm. the same kind of laws about you know, NGO funding, um, you know, um, the space that NGOs work in, the requirement for registration, the requirement for shutting you down, and you know, the activities that NGOs can get involved in. Of course, um, affecting organizations like ours as well. And then you move you know, into more of Central Africa, the Horn, one of the countries where for a long time was a, well, a kind of an oasis of stability in Central Africa in a region that's been troubled by conflict and other kind of disasters is Cameroon. <coughs> um, to have Cameroon in the last three years or so devolve into this, you know, crisis in the Northwest and the Southwest has been a huge challenge for us. For a long time, we never had work on Cameroon, but suddenly, you know, we had calls from different partners and, you know, people on the ground asking why human rights organizations were not in the country. And then just going in there and realizing that not just government forces, I mean, what started initially as a civil situation you know, challenges to government policies on education, on introduction of the French language in courts, in the court system, in the school system, uh, suddenly spiraled out of control with the government response of shooting into the crowd, arresting and hauling thousands of people into, into detention. It essentially turned into a very volatile and violent situation with um, citizens from that part of Cameroon taking up arms against the government, but also against the people accused of being complicit with the government. So they're burning schools, they're they are abducting teachers and students, they're burning entire villages, and the military, the, the Cameroonian military, is doing the same. At the same time in that country, you also have the political situation. President Bia has been in office for more than 30 years, he's in his 80s. I know, I know John doesn't want us to talk, doesn't want us to talk about um, the, the old, um, um, uh, autocrats who cling to power in Africa. But that is one example where young people um, are, are agitating for a change in leadership. Some people have never known any other president in their lifetime in that country, and they want that change to happen. How the government is responding to that has become a problem for Cameroon. And then you move into the, into the Sudans. Sudan is, we're tentatively optimistic that the situation there would only get better and that at the end of the first half of the three-year period of, of transition, the military will indeed vacate the position and allow civilians to rule and that there will be elections. But so far, I mean, lots of positives. It is the people getting on the streets and that's been emblematic of the trend across Africa. It is young people getting in, onto the streets and staying in the streets standing off against military tanks, against you know, live ammunition intended to frighten and scare them back home, back to complacency, and they stood their ground until al-Bashir's government came down. Now, I mean, our role is not to support the, 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 the pulling down of one government or the other, but it is amazing to see the power that people have and their season of the power from governments that have denied them the opportunity to participate actively in their own government or to have their rights respected. So as basic as you know, economic issues, the, the, the price of bread and fuel, the same thing we saw happen in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. the, the, the people got on the streets, but they were able in Zimbabwe to quickly put out that fire and the people went back home. But in Sudan, the young people stood on the streets until the change happened. You know, and, and we can almost put that, um, uh, uh, the, the same scenario in what happened in Ethiopia. It was really people protesting month after month after month until the point where it was impossible for the government to continue to resist or to ignore their claims. And a change happened in the government. So that, that's the trend that we're seeing everywhere. But we're also seeing governments responding 
in places like Tanzania out of fear for what protests could do with internet shutdowns, with censorship of, of social media, of traditional media. Um, they, they tried it in Sudan, it didn't work. It, 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 I think it succeeded to some extent. In Zimbabwe, it quelled the, the, the protest. In other places, so you, you, you see governments looking for ways to seize back the control. But across Africa, the, the, the youth bulge in Africa is real. And we have really restive young people who understand the power that they hold as citizens, who know their rights, and are willing to face off any kind of military or harsh clampdown from the government. That's an encouraging way to conclude. Thank you uh, for a very complex picture. I just want to press further for all three of you maybe on, on one point that I think became apparent as you were speaking, which is how much people in Africa and different countries watch what the other countries are doing. And this is a reflection, I think, you know, when I was in Peace Corps in the early 80s in Zaire, uh, we all got the magazine Jeune Afrique uh, every few weeks, and we got the Radio France Internationale, and we got a couple of other ways in which we could track what was going on in other parts of the continent, but not much. You know, there was no social media, there was no internet, and things are a lot different. And as you say, the youthful populations in Africa have a sense of their own rights and also of where protest has worked, where pursuit of their own rights has worked elsewhere. Unfortunately, the bad guys learn too. Oh, yeah. And you, you, you know that as well. So I just, it's a sort of a broad question, but I wondered to what extent do you find this sort of cross-national communication a new dynamic that is really offering a lot more opportunity. We, I don't want to sound too giddy because we saw with the Arab Spring, mm -hmm. we were all thinking in 2000, hey, everybody's on Twitter, and what happened in Tunisia just brought down Mubarak, and now Gaddafi's on the way out, and then all of a sudden the Arab Spring turned into an Arab nightmare for the most part, with a couple of exceptions. So I don't want to sound overly, you know, Pollyannish, but I'm just curious, uh, to what extent do you feel like these cross-national dynamics have become a big part of how Africa pursues human rights and political reform? If I could begin with you and just work down, Mousy. I mean, I think, I think that um, there's a lot of communication going on between different groups. Um, so where you have organized civil society, it's easier, but there are also these indi young individuals, I've l just learned the term, called influencers. You know, there are different people, young people who have massive followership on social media, whether it's on Facebook, it's on Twitter, it's, you know, Instagram, whatever platform that they find. And it is across borders. Mm. So, for example, let, let, if I take the example of, of Cameroon, what's happening in Cameroon, a lot of the support and organizing happened with Nigerian groups, supporting Cameroonian groups to protest, to fight against the government, and the government of Cameroon responded with the cooperation of the Nigerian government to arrest the activists in Nigeria, take them back to Cameroon, and put them to trial. Um, but you know, the, the, the agitation and, and, the, and, and the activism helped from across the different, um, I think maybe across the borders, with, with Nigeria and, and, and Cameroon. But it's beyond just with among African countries. Um, I'll give you a very negative example of how, how what's happening in one part of the world can be manipulated and you know, instrumentalized by you know, a, a bad government or bad institution. When President Trump um, issued that, uh, made that statement about the US border police um, authorities, you know, um, the, the giving them the permission to, to shoot at, um, at, at ch I think it was children, trying to cross into the US. There was a video on it now, just about the same time, that same week, the Nigerian military had been in a confrontation with a minority Muslim Shia group in Abuja and shot and killed about 42 of them. We, um, um, Human Rights Watch and several other organizations had begun to engage with them, you know, to, to hold them to account for, the, for these abuses. And the next thing the Nigerian military did was to put up the video of President Trump on their Twitter page. That's, this is in the Nigerian military, Nigerian army Twitter page, and said, if this is happening in the US and it is okay for it to happen in the US, why can it not happen here? You know, so you, you're, you're finding, people are finding justification and finding, uh, they are being emboldened by bad behavior somewhere, elsewhere in the world, and for a country like the US.
who, you know, for, for many years, for good or for bad, the U.S. has never been perfect, but has been, um, I think, a worthy ally on human rights issues um, in, in terms of advocacy and pushing the frontier of human rights across the world to have a, a government, a senior government official in the U.S., you know, pushing out the messaging that autocrats and abusers of human rights can utilize to, to, to justify their bad behavior is shocking. So, you know, the internet has is, is created this borderless ecosystem that no one can control, but there are attempts to manipulate and to control it for good or for bad. Thank you very much. John, I wonder if you had any comments. Well, on just a, a couple quick things. There's definitely the sort of cross-border learning and interaction as you're talking about. There's also a lot of learning going on within the countries. Right. Uh, and again, look at Sudan. In 2013, there were large-scale protests that the government violently put down, more than 200 people killed. Uh, that was a real setback for the pro-democracy, human rights uh, section of the population. But a lot of people really learned and studied that experience. And there was a ton of planning that went into the protests that started last December, continued for six months or more, and that were able to resist the typical government pushback. People learned from that past experience and other past experience. People studied experiences from elsewhere, and they were able to develop a lot of tactics that allowed them to stay on the street and to occupy the square right in front of military headquarters in a way they never could have in the past. I just want to pick up on a point that, that Mousy and, and Michael, you've raised too, which is on the authoritarian learning and the pushback. And Mousy mentioned in particular the NGO legislation that is happening across the continent. We did a research project on this last year. There are 12 different countries in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, that over the last 15 years have adopted various versions of repressive NGO legislation that seeks to constrain their registration, that seeks to constrain their funding sources. There are six more countries that have versions of this kind of legislation working their way through the system. Um, this is, I think, an increasing threat that we see. You know, it's not sort of out on the streets killing people, uh, but it's in some ways just as sinister because it doesn't even allow people to get to the streets in the first place. A lot of this, uh, you know, Massey mentioned legislation in Sierra Leone. A lot of it was also modeled on a terrible piece of law from Ethiopia, which has actually since been removed, and a new version is much improved. <coughs> Uh, but nonetheless, the model was still there. Tiseki. So, so uh, in terms of organizing, we have seen that kind of organizing uh, at a national level um, across the continent, right? Amongst um, social movements, uh, civil society groups. The flip side, like John said, is the NGO legislation. Another thing we're seeing now is the, the uh, introduction of um, uh, cyber crime and cyber security laws. Mm -hmm. Um, and this, of course, is designed to prevent the type of organizing and mobilization of social movements and civil society organizations on the ground. Um, so not just internet shutdowns, but preventing people from discussion and from, from criti criticism online um, under the guise of, of cyber security. Um, and in, in Southern Africa, we've seen this law in, in countries such as Lesotho. We have seen discussions around introducing it in Zimbabwe, um, in Malawi, and that's a red flag. Um, and so I think the challenge for us and, and the organization we've seen in Southern Africa has been particularly different because it's mainly centered um, in the urban areas. And we have not seen countrywide demonstrations for, for a number of reasons. The, the first one is um, the, the stranglehold that in many countries the securocrats have the militarization, in particular in countries such as Zimbabwe, um, the stranglehold in countries such as Angola, where people in the rural areas in particular are unable to mobilize, to organize themselves. And this in some ways has deterred the kind of widespread um, uh, mobilization that we've seen, I think, in places such as Sudan, um, which have brought countries to a standstill and to a halt. Um, and uh, so these red flags are the kind of things that we need to see addressed in terms of how people can challenge mm. um, uh, the, the structures, the current structures that exist and the, the authoritarian regimes that we have um, across the continent in the region. And I'm also going to add Uga Uganda and Tanzania to the mix mm. in terms of this general trend.
I want to come back in a minute to ask you all about U.S. policy implications and what we should be trying to learn. Uh, but before I do that, I want to sort of be begin with one other big, broad philosophical question that's occurred to me listening to you, which is the kind of narrative that strong men leaders use to try to suppress political and human rights. Uh, you know, they'll do specific things like you mentioned, suppress NGOs, uh, put in new cyber restrictions. But I'm, I'm just curious, comparing Africa to other parts of the world, you know, I was very uh, taken by Timothy Snyder uh, and his book at Yale, The uh, Path to Unfreedom. And Bob Kagan here has written about the new authoritarianism as well, where leaders like Putin or Erdogan uh, or Orban in Hungary, um, maybe even Duterte to an extent in the Philippines, they use a very nationalistic narrative to justify clampdowns on their own people mm -hmm. because they claim that the domestic dissidents are actually tools of the West or of the international community and therefore they need to be suppressed because they can't be viewed as authentic to Russian or Turkish or Hungarian or Filipino politics. And I know we see this in a few other places too, but all those places I mentioned are outside of Africa. And we know that Africa, the countries tend to have borders that were drawn by colonial powers. Mm -hmm. And so it's not always as clear to me if that same sort of nationalistic message would be imposed or you know, superimposed on top of just old-fashioned strongmen desires to keep power. So if you see what I'm driving at, are there certain kinds of excuses that autocrats in Africa tend to make? Again, we're being very <laughs> sweeping here and talking about 50 countries at once. But do you see a trend that any particular approach is being adopted that echoes some of what's going on in Russia or Turkey or anywhere else? And uh, I don't know if you'd like to start with that one. Um, very quickly, I mean, we're seeing this type of popularism with Magufuli in Tanzania. This type of um, sentiment of, of uh, the identity of Tanzanians and, and the sort of xenophobia even cutting across East Africa in mm. terms of the relationship between Tanzania and Kenya. Um, we have seen these types of attempts in Zimbabwe. Um, and as we sit here continentally, uh, Mausi and I are puppets of the West in, in, oh, yeah. in the view um, of, of, of the Zimbabwean authorities. So certainly, yes, I think this appeal to, to nationalistic tendencies is something that we see across the globe and, mm -hmm. and, and something that African governments also uh, kind of refer to. And it, to a certain extent, in a, in a country as democratic as South Africa, that kind of popularist sentiment and nationalistic sentiment, especially around elections, talking about the others and, and the foreigners coming into our country, um, is, quite, is quite popular. And John, in addition to putting that same question to you, let me invite you to put questions to your colleagues. I want to thank John for helping me conceptualize this event, realizing the kind of talent that we would have in Washington this week. So uh, thanks again, and, and uh, please feel free after you give your own answer to, to add another question uh, for Mousy that you know, we could all then address about uh, anything else on the agenda. But, but do you see this sort of nationalistic narrative being employed more than before? I think one of the wrinkles to that in Africa is you have the dynamic between nationalistic identity and ethnic identity, which is not unique to Africa, but I think differentiates it from some other parts of the world. And you have some places where leaders, not for mean-spirited purposes, are trying to elevate national identity uh, in order to balance that out with some very strong ethnic identities that bring with it um, violence, frankly. Um, and that's the case in Ethiopia right now, where the prime minister is trying to create sort of this single political party and trying to talk about an Ethiopian national identity, uh, whereas a lot of Ethiopians think of themselves as part of one of the many different ethnic groups. Uh, you know, it's actually notable that today there is a referendum in the southern part of Ethiopia for one particular ethnic group to have its own ethnic state. Um, and so Prime Minister Abiy, I think, for a lot of noble reasons, is trying to push back against that. Uh, we'll see how that goes. You know, in terms of the sort of justifications that authoritarian leaders use for their actions, one of them is nationalism, another one is counterterrorism. Uh, and some leaders have been very good at sort of playing the counterterrorism card and, you know, we have to do these tough things in the interests of fighting back against extremism. And, of course, that plays into a Western narrative as well. Um, and that, you know, in their eyes and sometimes in Western eyes too, uh, provides cover for some very harsh, excessively harsh responses to extremism. And I think in countries like Burkina Faso, uh, in Mali, we're seeing that, whereas you know, a lot of people are as afraid of the official forces of the military as they are of any extremists. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll just add to that. And um, it, 
beyond where the, the context where you have you know uh, terrorism and counterterrorism operations it's the national security question mm -hmm. so you know whether it's you know the, the we have a tension with a neighboring country or we have you know an internal group that is tending towards interaction in, in Cameroon, for example, or you know, Eritrea for many years um, instrumentalized the, the tension between the country and Ethiopia um, to, to impose a national service that is indefinite in nature and could last for many years, you know, starting with secondary school children in their final year of secondary school, and they could be in it for 20 years, they could be in it for 40 years. It is a major driver of, of, of refugees from, from that country. Uh, I think the last estimate was about 4,000 uh, every month living in Eritrea um, for, for elsewhere in a country that is, has a population of about 6 million people. That's huge. Um, but in, in, in other places, you also have the, 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 the claim to African values. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in the pushback against LGBT rights, um, other minority rights, you know, these are on African. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, 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 the imposition from the West is, you know, the, it, trying to bring what is alien to Afrin African culture and cloak it in the garment of human rights. And so we constantly face those challenges um, uh, and, and the pushback, especially in advocacy. It's always interesting to hear Africans. And I say, well, yeah, I'm African too. I don't know what values you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But people also instrumentalize the history of colonialism. Most African countries have been free of colonialists for at least a decade. But, and many have been for more than 60, 60 years. Most have been for more than 60 years. And yet till today, the reason why human rights values and norms and standards that they, I have to say, would sign up to, especially the international conventions, but then reject the obligation that that imposes on them to ensure the enjoyment of those rights for citizens in country, because suddenly they have become Western. Um, because, they, of course, there is a cost mm -hmm. to the, 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 those who would want to impose power uh, on, on, on others um, to ensuring and protecting and promoting human rights in the country. And so you have all of these arguments, but you know, I it's very easy to defeat most of them. And, and can I just add that we do have an interna a regional and continental human rights framework Absolutely. that is quite robust in the African Charter on Human People's Rights, which is one of the most progressive um, human rights instruments um, globally. We have the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. We have the African Court on Human Rights. Um, but the, the problem is, um, the, the lack of enforcement and implementation in terms of the frameworks, it's, uh, the framework itself and the norms and standards that exist on the continent. Yeah. John, anything you want to comment or ask of our panelists? Well, no, if I can take up your offer to, Please. to introduce a new topic with, with my colleagues. Um, and it builds on what Mousy is talking about in terms of definition of human rights, because you know, when I am on the continent and particularly speaking with government leaders, I think this is especially true in Southern Africa, there's an accusation that you Westerners, you think of human rights in a very narrow sort of term. You think about civil rights, civil liberties in particular. Um, but there's also a strand of thinking that we should be talking equally about social rights and economic rights, right to housing, right to education, right to health care, and so forth. And that, I mean, that's a, a very valu valuable view in some ways. But I'd be curious how my colleagues think about that um, you know, as we sort of push for adherence to human rights. So, so what I can say is, I mean, there's been this push that we have to have place equal weight on economic and social and cultural rights and, and civil and political rights in, uh, on the continent. That's been the debate. Um, but at the same time, what we have seen is that this hasn't been as successful as, 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 as governments have, have argued. So we still, we're still seeing marginalization and gross inequalities in places like South Africa that have not delivered on the rights to housing, the rights to education, the rights to health. And that's because of the kind of gross corruption that we see on our continent, that we see in Southern Africa, which is coupled with the democratic deficit and, and the accompanying um, human rights violations in an attempt to entrench themselves, we're seeing um, these small political elites across the continent clinging on to power desperately, committing violations, um, and marginalizing communities and, 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 and the wider majority. So that argument does not actually hold water because there have been very few considered attempts 
to actually improve the social and economic rights of the people in Southern Africa and in the, on the continent, I would argue. I mean, it, it's, it's one area that we, we constantly get the, um, the, uh, that, that argument. Um, and it's been very easy for us to respond to because we actually do a lot of work on econo economic and social rights. The challenge is that economic and social rights by their nature require government funding. And the, the pushback we get from government is, oh, you cannot, as civil society, impose on the government certain standards when it comes to access to health care, access to education, because that would mean that you are questioning the sovereign power mm. of the government to determine how it utilizes and deploys its resources. So for example, there is the universal basic primary education which governments across Africa have failed to implement for people, especially in rural areas. We've done tons of, of, of research and presented them to government and they say, oh, actually we don't have the money to do this. So since you work for a Western organization, why don't you get, help us get the funds? But then we, we bring the proof of loans taken from the World Bank, from different organizations to fund these institutions that never really gets to the source, to the, to the point of um, uh, providing the service. And then we, we, tra we trail it all the way back to the funding institutions and organization because it's difficult to hold African governments, many African governments to account on how, this, on how they prioritize their spending. Mm -hmm. And that is what economic and social rights are about. It's about housing, it's about education, it's about health. It is about how the, the exploitation of natural resources fail to benefit mm. the people whose, from whose land the, 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 the resources are being t uh, exploited. And so we, we, we constantly face that pushback and we end up back focusing our advocacy using the supply chain all the way back to the end user of the, of, the, of the raw material. So whether it's coal, whether it's aluminum, whether it's bauxite, um, whatever it is, we trade it all the way back to IFIs, IFCs, you know, corporations in the West who are a lot more amenable and then through their own influence on African governments can assert pressure. By the way, where do we situate uh, the right to have a safe neighborhood? Because that gets in into a complex space of policy where we're asking police forces to be effective and tough on crime, but fair to suspects. And of course, that's always a conversation that's complicated. How do you situate sort of the right to a safe neighborhood, the, the sort of safety from crime within this broad taxonomy? I don't know if any of you want to answer that. or John, you have an answer to that? I mean, it's, it's a really tricky one um, because it's, it, it, it's easy to fall in, in that um, trap of asking for a police state or an overly militarized state. Yeah. And so, so for, I'll give you the example of something that happened recently in Nigeria. Now Nigeria has been battling Boko Haram um, for the past, what, um, 10 years now. And um, just earlier, I think it was the beginning of October, the Nigerian military, not the government, not the civil authority, the Nigerian military issued an instruction that every Nigerian, everyone move, moving in Nigeria between the 15th of November and the end of, the, of December needed to hold an identification document with them and that there would be stop and start. And at the end of it was a line that said, please dress appropriately. <laughs> and you know, that, that, it, 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 it gives you a pause. Where is this coming from? And when there were questions raised, the, 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 the instruction was challenged and the military said, oh, we're trying to fish out who is Boko Haram and who isn't because, you know, Boko Haram doesn't have a nameplate on their heads saying this is who we are. And so we need to check. It is for the protection of everyone because we don't want Boko Haram to spread out of the Northeast where it's traditionally operated to the rest of the country. It's been successfully challenged in court. Um, and, and so the military has shelved that plan. But it would recall, it's the same thing that we've seen with the NGO bills. It's around national security. It is funding of terrorism that we're trying to control. Mm. 
And then, you know, so they, they bring in these laws and you, ch you challenge that and they say, oh, it's because, of, uh, it's because of money laundering. It's, you know, to protect the economy of this country. So, you know, almost every time when you're asking for over involvement of the state, mm. you run the risk of them going the other end of the pendulum yeah. and bring in human rights restrictions. And you're raising a key trend, which is extrajudicial killings by the police. Yep. Um, which is something that is something that is a huge concern across the continent again and in Southern Africa and places like Malawi, Zimbabwe, attempts to address crime often lead to um, people who are suspected of crimes and South Africa dying in the streets. Um, so with, uh, with little accountability on the part of the police. So I think when we talk, and actually what you talk about in terms of policing neighborhoods, um, one of the big big issues in South Africa is about the privatization of, of, of policing and the security of services in South Africa in the, in the, in the name of combating crime, um, which is a big problem. But, but at what point in terms of um, are private security forces legally accountable? Um, and so those are the fundamental questions, and, and we do see these types of problems and issues um, in the region. John, any comment or follow-up question? I think we'll go to the audience. I'm going to suppress my own interest in asking about U.S. policy on the assumption that I'll probably come up with some of your questions, and if necessary, I'll interject it later. Let's begin all the way back. We'll take about three or four questions at a time and then come back to the panel. So we'll take those two in the far back row and then one more here in the middle. Hi, um, my name is Pearl Matibe. Thank you very much I, for the broad uh, issues that you discussed today. So before I get to my question, I just want to add a bit of a story, um, uh, in particular about what happened in Zimbabwe today. Okay, uh, Right now it's way after 8 o'clock p.m. at night in Harare, and a 10-month-old baby is tonight sleeping in the Harare Central Police Station because her mother was arrested and be um, beaten up at the protests today. Um, one thing that I'm not hearing you talk about is these, um, I want to call it uh, liberation brotherhood leaders across the continent, in particular in SADC countries, um, who are, whose tactics are evolving. And also the issue of the junta, who have now pretty much uh, the state institutions have been, uh, I want to say, militarized, so they've infiltrated all the state institutions. What recent research or gaps in research, in policy research, uh, are you aware about that is following the new tactics uh, that are being used, um, particularly by security sector, these new pieces of legislation, and this... Um, I want to say brotherhood agreement amongst African countries to, um, in their approaches to freedom of assembly and this violence. So if you could speak to gaps in research to the evolving situations. Thanks. Thank you. If you could hand the microphone to the gentleman to your left, please. Yes. Hi, my name is Steven Chukuma. Um, so I have a question for you, Malsi. Um, I think you touched, you touched on the fact that governments are learning how to push back, so by controlling social media and so many other avenues. And we're also seeing a trend, so they're using legal institutions, the courts, to actually push back. Nigeria, for example, so I don't know if you're aware of the case with the Sahara Reporters Publisher and so many other journalists who have been recently arrested and taken to court and charged on treason. Um, I would like to hear what your thoughts are about that. And also, Kiseki, I think you mentioned something about LGBT rights and talked about some of the successes that we've seen in terms of Zimbabwe, sorry, Botswana, but also in Zimbabwe. Not yes, Zimbabwe. but also Zimbabwe, how a transgender woman recently won a yes. case against the government. Um, yeah. um, oh, oh awesome. great. Um, awesome. So I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are about, you know, the laws changing and people going to courts, but also we haven't seen so much change in terms of people's attitudes and their understanding of these issues. And then we'll take one more from the gentleman in about the seventh row here on the aisle. And then we'll come back to the panel. Uh, thank you. I'm Leon Weintraub, a retired member of the Foreign Service. Uh, with my experience in, in Africa in the Foreign Service, I, I've learned about a lot of uh, attempts working through the Human Rights Bureau, with AID, with the National Endowment of Democracy, to develop institutions that are strong enough to outlast the whims, let us say, of individuals. It seems a, a lot of the progress that you've cited has been, been made because of change of certain individuals uh, or only in the face of protest. I'm wondering if any of you can cite some examples where 
through the strengthening of maybe a bar association, civil society, or strengthening of legislatures to fight against overly strong executives? Are there examples of strong institutions that are, are able to outlast the whims of individuals? So why don't we start with Mousy, because you got one put right to you. And feel free to take maybe one or two of the questions, and we'll just work down the panel. Okay, um, I'll take the Nigeria question uh, about um, you wanted to know what, what we are doing or what we think. So the trends that you're seeing, actually. So, I mean, in the past one year, we've, we've documented, I don't know, how many cases of arrest and detention of, of journalists and, and breaking into media houses, whether it's media trust, dark communications, um, and, you know, several others, and, you know, journalists covering uh, the, the protests recently got arrested, got beaten, and some covering the elections in, in, in Bayelsa and in, and in Kogi State just over the weekend uh, got beaten and arrested. And um, usually what, what happens is, one, the, the military, the Nigerian military, is overactive in the civic space. The, the police has been reduced to incompetence of the worst levels. And so where, where the government wants you know, a really heavy-handed response and wants to quell um, protest and uprising, they bring in the military. The other institution of state that has been used to repress and to you know, just exemplify its government's intolerance is the DSS, is the Nigeria Secret, Secret Police. Um, this police that is supposed to be secret is so unsecret. It's in your face. It's issuing press releases. It's arresting individuals. Um, you know, but but show, well, I want to just say that Shower's case is a lot more complicated than just the usual journalist um, 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 repression. Um, Showere, as you probably know, ran for, for presidency, um, but he, he's also an activist. So he crosses the boundaries between just you know, um, media rights and, and journalism to being an activist. He was calling for protest um, with a tag, revolution now, and that phrase alone the government took and insisted meant a call to arms against the Nigerian state. And this is why they have um, chosen to, li to, to label uh, him with a charge of treason. Um, of course, all of that is being, is, is being challenged in the courts. And so I will quickly jump to that last question. The institutions that can be strengthened or have been strengthened to push back against the excesses of the executive, I would say number one is the judiciary. In many countries, it has been the, 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 the savior for many. It's shut down a number of these NGO, NGO laws. It's shut down and, and, and held the government to account for disappearances of individuals, for de detention without, without trial. Um, but you know, the, so in, in some countries, the, the, these institutions are only as strong as the executive allow them to be. So the laws can be changed. The constitutions have been amended to whittle down their power. The, the judges have been intimidated, removed from office. Some have been completely disappeared. Some have been killed because they're doing their job. But I think that if, if there's any strength anywhere, it lies in the judiciary. The legislature can also be one where it is independent of the executive you know, it, because it, has, it represents, you know, a, a, a plurality um, and, and, you know, the, 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 the wide spectrum of, of strata across the country, you can find um, what my colleague likes to call positive deviants in, 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 in legislatures who do not represent the dominant view but have influence to walk behind the scenes to change things. Um, I, in, in some places, you know, if you're, if you're looking at government institutions, the National Human Rights Commissions have some measure of success as well. Very measured because, again, once they become um, over, over, overly powerful and effective, the government has a way of cutting down, one, their funding, their independence, imposing the government stooge to, to man the office. And, you know, it's, Africa presents a, a, a challenge in transposing um, remedies that have worked elsewhere. Um, you, you, it, 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 you, you have to apply a, a lot of nuance. 
and, and contextualization in applying some of those principles that have worked in other places. But um, we've seen it work um, in a few places, and um, we can only continue to try. I know you've got some first-hand experience in that because one of your previous jobs was with the Nigeria the Human 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 Commission. Yeah. John, over to you. Yeah, pick up on a couple of these. First, the question on institutions, and I fully agree that a dollar invested in institutions is better than just about anywhere else. Um, one country in particular I would note is South Africa. Mm -hmm. And you know, just like you might want to pick up on more of this, but when you talk to a lot of South Africans about how the country got through some very difficult years under President Zuma, they will point to three things. They'll point to the judiciary, and to the media, and to civil society, uh, all of which stayed strong and exposed uh, incredible levers, levels of state capture and corruption, uh, which is part of what contributed to President Zuma's downfall and right now uh, him facing trial for a lot of what happened on his watch. Another country I would point to is Ghana. Uh, which is a, a good achiever uh, in terms of governance and human rights as well. Um, you look at the election commission in Ghana, which at this point is a pretty strong independent entity. Uh, you know, it's, it wavers sometimes, but for the most part has overseen five elections of pretty good quality and improving quality and has really gotten good at doing that. Um, you know, another example from Ghana is how the country has managed some of its natural resources. Uh, you know, Ghana had oil coming online a few years ago. I don't want to overstate it, but it has generally done well in terms of transparency and in terms of having civil society input into legislation that governs the natural resource sector. Um, some of that can be attributed to uh, donor support and to investments over the years. A lot of it is attributed to you know, fantastic Ghanaians who have done great work over the years. Uh, and just to the first question on sort of the solidarity amongst liberation movements, I'm not sure about gaps in the research, but I would just point out, in addition to the very clear dynamics in southern Africa, uh, I think we see a lot of that right now in East Africa. And I would point in particular to dynamics between Uganda and South Sudan, where President Museveni is uh, the real protector of President Kiir in South Sudan, uh, a president who, in my view, is not a legitimate leader of that country. Um, and throughout East Africa, you see a real reluctance uh, to challenge President Kiir in particular, although there's a lot to challenge there, uh, but to question anybody else uh, because of the sort of brotherhood, and unfortunately it is all brothers, uh, that exists amongst those leaders. Thank you, Tseki. Um, thanks, Paul, for that for for your for your two questions. I'm just going to take on um, what you, what you just said, John, about this history in terms of liberation movement. Um, this is this is a sad indictment of the Southern Africa development community, where we have seen this um, emphasis on a shared history of political liberation. Um, national sovereignty um, and the, the protection of, 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 of these regimes on the continent, all of it is in the name of the liberation struggle and, and this sense of entitlement that they won independence um, for, for their countries and are therefore entitled to the resources and to rule in perpetuity. Um, this leads me to the, the protection of the junta in Zimbabwe. And when you talk about gaps in research, uh, there have been a couple of there were a couple of reports um, before Mnangagwa came into power, talking about the securitization of the state in Zimbabwe and the militarization of the state and the influence of the likes of, of Chiwenga and Perez Shiri um, throughout Mugabe, Mugabe's um, rule, but also um, going into Mnangagwa's rule at the moment, where these guys have now removed their uniforms and have put on suits and are pretending that they are now Democrats. And uh, as we are seeing, uh, in, in light of the protests that we've seen and the clampdown, what we know is nothing has changed. Um, what I can say, it's very telling that um, a lot of political positions, a number of um, military, former military officials who are involved in the bloodless coup that took place in 2017, who have been uh, involved in Gukurahundi, for example, have now been placed in ambassadorial positions. And most of them, what Ndangagwa has done, is to send them out to ambassadorial posts, away from, from the local dynamics. Part of it, of course, is to preserve his own 
um, source of power, but at the same, same time is to, is to protect them from, from being, being sanctioned, and, sanctioned and being held accountable for, for past abuses. Um, and, and, and it is this that I think the international community, when Nagago came into power, uh, chose to sanitize in many ways um, and did not want to address. And those of us who are saying this is just, you know, <laughs> old wine in the new skin were not listened to. But now this is coming to the fore, and what we're seeing, sadly, is a return to the old tactics of Mugabe in terms of the levels of repression. Um, and I think there is a need to document in more detail just how militarized Zimbabwe is and has always been. And I think there's not enough policy research um, in that area. Um, on the issue of uh, LGBTI rights and, and the laws, the, the, the two countries that we've seen, Botswana and, and uh, Angola, um, what is telling in the, in the case of Botswana is that there are now attempts to bring back the law. And that is because of, of, of public opinion, in quotation marks. Um, but what I would say is a challenge from, from, the, from the religious right and, and from some Christian groups um, complaining about this decision by, by the judges to actually repeal these, 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 these anti-gay um, laws. Um, across the, the region in Southern Africa, we, we know that these laws are cake. They're colonial um, anti-sodomy laws. For the most part, the, the governments have chosen not to actually enforce them um, in places like Malawi. Um, but we cannot uh, run away from the cultural sentiments um, and, 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 and public opinions that, that a lot of governments use as an excuse to clamp down on, on LGBTI um, activists. And so for me, these, these two cases are actually precedent setting because we have not seen this on the continent before. And so it's, it's only the beginning. The next step is how to um, sensitize communities, the cultural changes, bringing in um, the religious institutions and the churches, some of whom have, have been engaged in this, in this battle, um, and, and, and having this general movement that will pressure other governments to, to bring about these laws, but also to, to fully implement them to, to end discrimination against the LGBTI community. Um, I won't speak to the institutions. John has spoken about South Africa. I'll speak a little bit about Botswana, which is an interesting example, although under Kama, things changed. I, I would argue that's another example where strong institutions um, led to the proper management of, of resources, um, a relatively independent judiciary. We saw this unravel under former President Kama's rule, um, and we have seen a continued clampdown to some extent on the media. But it is one example where it wasn't just uh, civil society. Excellent. I think we have time for another big round, so let's do that, and then we'll come back to the panel for what's probably going to be the wrap-up. So let me start here, work this side of the room. Uh, the woman about seven rows in, please, and the gentleman in the row right in front of her, and then up here as well. And then we'll see if I have, see how quickly these first three questions get posed. Hi. Um, Tiseke, I'm from Malawi as well. Um, so it's, a really, uh, it's really nice to see you here. Um, I was wondering, um, looking at what's going on in Malawi right now, I mean, we've had our fair share of corruption, electoral rigging, um, you know, political instability, and just general economic, uh, social struggles. Um, but we've never seen Malawians really come up and challenge the government like this. What do you think is the reason that leads, um, you know, that leads people to this tipping point where they're like, you know, enough is enough. Uh, we will um, put ourselves out there and it doesn't matter how the government um, hits back, but we are going to continue to put pressure on, on the government until um, we see change. So that's one. And two, speaking of trends, do you think that Kenya has set a trend um, looking also, Kenya. yeah, with um, the overturning of the um, the um, uh, court judgment to um, uh, to have a rerun, an electoral uh, rerun. Do you think that that's something that we will now see uh, trending in Africa as well? Also, looking at Malawi. I mean, we have our own case in Malawi right now. Do you do you see any change happening there? Thank you. Thank you. And the gentleman here, right in front of you. Yep. Hey, my name is Augustine. Um, my 
not quite a question, but a comment which um, I, I, I have heard you, Michael, talk about the, the influence of the U.S. or, you know, the impact of the U.S. in all these discussions. Uh, and, you know, Moses mentioned the, the, the learning from what other countries do, yeah. both within the continental region and outside, using the Trump example and shooting of the Shias in Nigeria. So um, I want us to, I would, you know, I would appreciate if they, we can talk more about that and uh, find ways that, you know, we can delink, you know, the, the different uh, uh, learning and unlearning between the African leaders and their international community or international uh, counterparts. And, um, you know, if we can, you know, make up or, you know, draw up a mechanism that can ensure that, you know, for some reasons what happens here, because it's, it can lead a multiplier effect that in, in time, in time, no, you know, no distant time, it's going to spread all over. And for some reasons, it's going to, you know, muffle the, the public space and it wouldn't just let anything happen because... Take, for instance, Nigeria as a giant of Af Africa, whatever they call it, maybe, is uh, a pushing on a hate speech bill, although it's it got a lot of uh, pushback lately, I mean, two, three days ago. Mm -hmm. But you can imagine what happens if that, you know, if it ha if comes to play in Nigeria. It's like it's going to spread very fast in West Africa. And with the support of, or I wouldn't call it support, but with the West looking away, they always look away from whatever is happening in Africa, and the, the African leaders copy whatever it is that they looked away from and they are doing in the West to use it to justify their actions. So if we can talk to more of that. Thank you. And then we've got a question here in the fourth row, please. Uh, thank you to everybody on the panel for this commentary and your perspectives on just real quick, uh, I heard a lot of reference to the failure of, you know, the, the having strong institutions, but I don't hear a lot about uh, what I would call popular civic education, on which I think is a fundamental distinction between the human rights framework here in the United States, where I think there's a much more general concept of what the Constitution actually says and the parameters it gives uh, just the general average citizen versus the framework in many African nations. I come from Nigeria originally, um, where I would say your average citizen actually doesn't have much familiarity with their national constitution or with the African Union Charter on people's rights. So could you guys speak to the process by which we're going to promote a popular education that can now provide the impetus for a pushback on those weaker institutions? Um, and then real quick, secondly, I think we're being a little bit disingenuous just discussing human rights in a vacuum without acknowledging the socioeconomic struggles in, on the continent. And why I say this is that, um, look at the nation Singapore, right? I think Singapore, actually, if we look at some of its ratings by like Freedom House and some of these other things, it's not always really rated high. But because it has such so great socioeconomic success, it escapes being, you know, looked at in terms of all these human rights frameworks and discussions. And I want to say that to what extent can we say that um, because of, you know, the lack of socioeconomic progress, like that basically many citizens in African nations might seemingly be willing to trade some human rights protections for some socioeconomic progress. And what would you guys say to that? You know, thank you. Well, those are some pretty big questions, so let's, I think we'll leave it at that and go to the panel. So uh, who would like to begin, and then we'll just work through everybody's uh, views. Take one or two questions each, if yeah. you like. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take, maybe I'll start from the very last question. Sure. Uh, and <clears throat> maybe using the example of Rwanda. Rwanda has been touted by many as the economic uh, miracle and development miracle in Africa. Um, but you, you just need to look beneath the surface and talk to ordinary Rwandans, especially outside of Kigali, to realize that there is um, an underbelly to all of that development that is totally unsavory. It is, you know, the human rights abuses, the cost to the individual, the, the fear that pervades the environment. People are afraid to speak. Those who dare to challenge the, 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 the president in, in elections are, you know, hounded into detention. People, Rwandans who speak against the state or the government, whether they live in Rwanda, uh, 
or they live here in the US or in Australia or in South Africa get disappeared from the streets where they are. People are afraid to talk. So, you know, how do you balance that? I think it was Tiseke that mentioned that, that I said earlier, you know, do we, do we focus on just economic and social rights or do we focus on just political and civil rights? Our argument has always been the two are indivisible. You cannot separate the two. How does, what, what is, my, 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 I think Augustine is from Nigeria. Um, he, 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 to, he talked about, um, or rather it was actually you who talked about education. What is the right to education without an attendant right to access to information? If you have all of the education and you have no access to getting the information that you need to educate your mind, to educate you about your rights, it's meaningless. And so it, the, the, both sets of rights have to go hand in hand. And we cannot prioritize one above the other. Now, when, when it comes to educating um, and, and raising awareness about human rights, a lot of the education is happening in schools. But what is the percentage of Africans that are in formal school environments. And so we, we, we still continue to leave a large number or, or, or percentage of the population out of that education until we can get them into functional literacy settings where they can, one, understand who they are, their place in society, and then what their rights are. And so it's, it's almost like a building block. But I, I would say that human rights organizations are probably not the best to do that. It, it comes in many forms, you know, but for those who are within formal school learnings, it is easier to get them educated. And that's what this country has. That's, that's what the West has. Most people at least have the very basic education, and that's the entry point in, into learning about human rights and civic rights and, and other issues. If I can quickly jump to, back to Augustine and his question about um, um, US foreign policy um, on human rights, or maybe just Western um, uh, human rights policies. Um, a lot of uh, Western countries, including the US, are grappling with domestic issues. Uh, and and a, a lot of those issues also raise questions about the legitimacy of their own human rights intervention outside of their borders. And so where, where, where you have, you know, the U.S., I'll give you this example, the U.S. challenging and whittling down the, the power and the influence of the International Criminal Court. Now, African governments have the issues with the courts. Some of it is totally understandable. But for to have the US attack that one institution that has had, until recently, the largest support base of the ICC has been in the African continent. It is African governments, for example, the Congolese government, who would submit their own people to the ICC. And then you have the US not only threatening the judges of the International Criminal Court, uh, but as well as canceling the, the, the visa of the prosecutor of the court because the court was about, the prosecutor was about to open an investigation into what happened in Afghanistan. This raises, this is what we hear from Africans all of the time. It is hypocrisy. You cannot preach what you're not practicing. So we need to see Western leadership on human rights values advancing these norms domestically before it can get translated to foreign policy. And until that happens, there's going to be resistance from anywhere to any kind of lecturing. Thank you, Mousy. John, over to you, please. Uh, let me just pick up as well on this sort of eternal debate on democracy and rights versus development. Um, and Mousy is absolutely right that Rwanda is you know, sort of at the center of this debate and is in fact referred to as the Singapore of Africa sometimes. Um, but I fully agree with what Mousy is saying. I also just want to note on Rwanda that there's a lot of questions about how real that economic success is and a lot of suggestions about how the numbers are not what they may seem to be. But the other example of that is Ethiopia. And of course, under Prime Minister Mellis for more than two decades, you know, he oversaw what, what he called a developmental state. And you know, it, it showed very large uh, economic growth rates, 9, 10, 11% a year. Uh, and you know, almost without question, millions of people were lifted out of extreme poverty during that time. But 
let's keep in mind that as was noted earlier, millions of people took to the streets for a sustained period in protest of the basic rights that they lacked under that sort of regime. And I think a lot of people were voting with their feet in that regard. Um, the debate is ongoing, <coughs> but I think when you look at an example like that, it says a lot about at least what Ethiopians, and I suspect a lot of Africans, value. Um, I want to make one sort of comment about U.S. policy as it's been coming up. And, you know, of course, things around here are difficult when we talk about promoting human rights. Um, you know, we have a, a lot of wonderful human rights champions come through Washington. A lot of them come to see organizations like ours, and, and we love that. But, you know, what I say to a lot of them is, it's great you're coming to Washington, New York, Brussels. I hope you're also going to Pretoria and Addis and Abuja. And I think some of them are, but I don't think enough of them are. And I think there's still sort of too much of looking for solutions in Western capitals, and those solutions are not coming from Washington sort of on a macro level right now, even though there's still good work that happens. Um, and I really do encourage a lot of that advocacy happening within Africa. I mean, one of the ongoing stories is, is South Africa going to make any sort of a pivot in its foreign policy under a new president, Ramaphosa, who, you know, in his heart of heart probably cares about these issues and shares a lot of the values that many of us do. Uh, he is constrained in many ways. Uh, and unfortunately, at a macro level, South African policy hasn't really pivoted in any meaningful way from where it was under Zuma. You know, that, that administration, that president, need to be feeling the pressure on championing these values, um, as, do, as does President Buhari for all of his limits. Uh, as does Prime Minister Abiy and some of the other big men on the continent, because there needs to be as much progress and as much pressure eventually coming from those places as there may be from Washington and elsewhere. Yeah. Tseki. So, so very briefly on, on Malawi, um, thanks for the question. And I think, again, Malawi is a symptom of what we're seeing when it comes to the holding of elections in Southern Africa, where most countries can validly claim that they hold regular elections. But the quality of those elections remains very, very questionable. And the inability of, of, of the Sadiq community to deal with that despite um, the guidelines that exist on, on democratic elections. And what often that translates into is a lack of trust and confidence by citizens in the outcomes of those elections, even in the cases where they may have the results themselves may be pretty credible and, and valid. And I think that is what has happened in Malawi for a long time. Malawi has held regular elections since, uh, since multi-party democracy in 1994. Um, and yet the quality of those elections has always been highly questionable to the frustration of its citizenry. And I think what we, we saw now was a combination of frustration over the quality of the elections, um, the economic um, conditions that Malawians face, um, the corruption scandals that, that have tainted um, the current president's um, um, presidency over the past four years. Um, and all that just came together and, and has boiled over into the frustrations where we've seen Malawians now coming up out into the streets and saying enough is enough. But at the same time, I think a positive thing that, that you're talking about is the, 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 the case being brought by the opposition before the high court and being open to all Malawians to hear the proceedings, which is something that we really um, you know, have in Southern Africa, where Malawians are able to hear the proceedings on radio and to, to see what's going on. I think that's, that's, that's a positive thing. Although, again, as I said, it's, it's highly unlikely that the, high, the, the constitutional court in Malawi is going to find in favor of the opposition um, for a number of reasons, including whether the, the evidence is, is material enough to have affected the outcome of those elections, right? Um, but that leads me to the, to the, to the Kenya um, scenario. I, I, I don't see that um, happening in, 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 the, in the case of Malawi because, as I said, there are questions over the Constitutional Court and its independence and whether it would actually find in favor of the opposition. That is very rare um, in Southern Africa, at least. Um, but perhaps my colleagues can speak to the Kenya outcome and maybe the effects on, on other parts. Um, well, what was interesting there is continent. that you know the, the court intervened in Kenya, yes. and then soon after in Liberia, yes. the court mm -hmm. intervened in a, yes. in a case there. And so there's a real concern, like, oh, this is going to be a trend, like, we're going to keep seeing this. But it didn't. We haven't seen it since, yes. I don't think. So two doesn't quite make a trend. 
As we wrap up, we have about 60 more seconds, so I'm just going to put my Peace Corps country on the table, DRC. Hasn't come up a lot today. Yeah. Any, interim, any interim assessment of how things are in the human rights space under President Xi Shikedi? I mean, DRC presents an interesting um, um, case. Um, the elections were, you know, nothing to write home about. Um, but we, we have become, I think, very cautiously optimistic that there are some pressure points within the Shizekedi presidency, especially one on accountability for past crimes. He's been very vocal around that. Um, right now, he's in the process of planning um, a conference um, on, 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 on accountability and criminality and international justice and all of that. But also, we, he, he's been amenable to pressure from a lot of groups not to appoint certain individuals who've been implicated in human rights abuses into office. He's not been successful with some others, we saw we're still finding traces of them. But I think that on the whole, I think that there might just, the DRC might, might be on, a, on the cusp of some change. Now, Kabila remains very visible. Uh, still very powerful and influential, but I think that uh, Felix Shizikedi is doing the much that he can to maintain some sort of control and power. And I think that for as long as he has that little window, um, we all, in the different ways and access that we have to him, need to help steer that in the right direction and ensure that he lives up to all of the promises that he's made. He continues to make the, the right noises. So it takes some good decisions, some not so good. But I think that overall, there is reason to be positive about the DRC. Well, unless one of you wants to add, I think that might be a very nice note to finish on in general for the continent. Very cautiously optimistic and remembering where we can collectively make whatever small difference we can all make. Uh, I think the three of you are making a big difference. So please join me in thanking them. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.